Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for being here with us, and thank you for just being so gracious and so kind to us, and just for your love and your faithfulness and just being so true. We just give you the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So first of all, I'd like to welcome some folks from Three Lakes Community Church. Welcome. So, so give a, a good hi and say, how you doing? Welcome. And, um, and then... Pastor George is back from his long hiatus. Thank you. It's so good to see you. I love him and, and so thankful for him. So good to see you. And Pastor Moses. So we're thankful for you too and for each and every one of you here. But um, also, there's Kenya trip coming up. If anybody wants to go, let us know. It, Kenya is in Africa, I think. Which, which is a little bit south of Texas, right? <laughs> So, um, or is it east of Texas? I think you got to swim. Yeah. So, if you're a good swimmer, talk to us. If not, then maybe the next trip or something. And anyway, that's coming up. Uh, it was good. We were in Texas with George, and um, after going to our daughter's wedding in Oklahoma, and um, George knocked it out of the park in that Bible study. And he's doing a lot of stuff in Texas you guys don't know about. We went to this general meeting, and they were honoring George for stuff he was doing in Kenya. And so, and when they did that, my heart just lit up because I was like, I am so proud of that man and for what, what God's doing and working through you and your church. So you keep rolling and keep, keep doing stuff for Jesus. So you're, you're, uh, you're special and we love you. So keep, keep rolling, bub. Right? So anyway, <clears throat> man, I was driving here. I was like, I always get plenty of time coming up. And then the last several days, like I've been breathing smoke. Like, I feel like I'm in a, like, like a barbecue or a smoker or something. So I'm out working on horses, and then I was, like, throwing hay around, and I couldn't hardly breathe. And then, then the next day, I was like, oh, man, i got to feed my horses again. So I go out, and I'm feeding my horses and come back. And so my voice is a little scratchy. It's because of the smoke. But um, it made me think of a scripture that God gave me when I was going down to Oklahoma. Because anytime you go into Oklahoma or Texas, you need to uh, need to be encouraged, <laughs> right? So it says this. But but now this is what the Lord says: He who created you, O Jacob; He who formed you, O Israel. Fear not; I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. So if you want to go to Kenya and swim with us, he'll be with you, right? But he says. If you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For you're you're so good. You do everything right. No. No, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Sheba in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. Amen. Well, that's pretty, pretty special, right? Why does he bless us? Because he loves us, right? None of us earn it. None of us could do anything for it. I was reading over here um, in, um, actually, where, where do I want to go? You know that Sukkot... Anybody know what Sukkot is? It's when, when you got your coat on. <laughs> right? So Sukkot is literally um, the Feast of Tabernacles. Right? So we're just coming through the, the, the Jewish um, New Year. Actually, we're coming from 5782 to 5783, which I thought was quite, quite unique because the rabbis always give a name to the year. So like last year was the name of becoming alert or becoming awake, but this year it's a year of the camel, right? It's camel, it's three. And so I was just thinking about it, the mouth, the speaking mouth and the camel, which what brings your blessings, what brings your goods in the Middle East was 
camels, right? When Jesus was born, the wise men came riding on, on quarter horses, right? No, they come, come driving in, in, in wagons pulled by oxen, right? No, no, you know what they, yes, you got it, right? You know, they come by what? Camel. Yeah, we even, like every Christmas, we got the camels coming. And this is the year of the camel, right? This is the year of God's blessings, the year of God doing great things in our lives. It's about the speaking mouth and the camel. And I love that because a lot of times we forget that God's blessings, when God says something, he says, my word will not return to me void but it will accomplish what I set it out to do. And so we can trust when God says something. But do you know Jesus celebrated uh, the Feast of Tabernacles? You're like, Pastor James, you're just talking about John 1 last week and, and how God is with us and we are one with him and all this, and now you're going to this. And I was like, hey, it all ties in. <laughs> so just watch. Hang with me for just a second. But it says... In John chapter 7, and I love John. I have fell in love with John all over. I was reading a book about John at Patmos. And just the wisdom that that dude had, man, the the heart for Jesus that John had was was like he even was so enamored with Jesus. He's like, when he addressed himself, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. Like, and it might be that he was a disciple who showed Jesus more love than any of the others in his own way. But he was like, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then when he had that revelation, they literally tried to poison him. They tried to, tried to kill him. They tried to do all kinds of things to him. And they couldn't get rid of him. Why? Because he had a revelation of who he was in Jesus. And he was resting in his love. And he knew, hey, God loves me. If God be for me, who can be against me? Greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world and so it makes you unbreakable unstoppable there's nothing that you can't accomplish and there's nothing that god can't do in and through you if you'll just say hey i surrender to who you are and i know that that comes not through through um acts and works but comes through a love relationship which produces good works and so when we see that it makes everything clear to us you know that jesus um um, everybody loved him when he was here, here on earth. Like everybody, like, like when he started a church, like everybody just come and just stayed in it and it just blew up and then no one ever challenged him. No one ever had any problems. No, because no, here I'm going in John chapter 7 and I was just reading in the, if you read in the chapter before this, he's talking about I am the bread of life. He just fed 5,000 men. Now, that's not counting women and children. He's just like, don't leave no fragment left. Not only did he feed all of them, he had 12 baskets full. He collected all the fragments, which is a clue for us, too, that he'll collect the fragments in our life, and he'll make them and turn them into blessings, and so, and he'll make it where it overflows. But here he is, and he's talking. He's like, I'm, I'm the bread of life. You know the manna that fell in the wilderness? That's me. You know the table of show, the showbread on the table of showbread in the, in the temple? That's me. I am the bread of life. And he's telling them this, and everybody goes to hot dog stand, man, because they had enough of fish and bread, right? Now everybody took off. Like, all of them left except the disciples. And here Jesus is deserted by everyone after he's already fed, you know, 5,000 after he's come walking on the water and they desert him. Now he's down to 12 and he's like, now, which one of you boys are going to go? He's like, and so it was a really, really hard time for Jesus. And then you hear him coming and this is where I love it because he's talking to his brothers. And you know, when you're talking to family, especially your brothers or sisters, they're going to encourage you all the time, right? (laughs) So here's Jesus, and it says in in John chapter 7, verse 1, After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, You ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even 
his own brothers did not believe him. So they're telling him, hey, you want to be, be this rock star? You want to be known? You want to be all this? Then you go present yourself and you do it in your own power and you do it in your own works and do it like we're trying to tell you to do it. And they're really, what they're really doing is they're making fun of him. Now this is Mary's kids, right? This is, this is the one who God chose to birth the Messiah into the world. This is her kids. This is his brothers, the ones that he grew up with. And they didn't even believe in him. Everybody else had deserted him except the 12, 12 disciples. And by deserted, I don't mean they brought him desserts. I mean, they left. And now he's at one of the greatest seasons. See, they just went through, through the month of Elel, which is, is basically the whole month before Rosh Hashanah, where, where the Bible talks about, about the rabbis say God, God's mercy always precedes his judgment. So he gives you a whole month to, to relish in the love. And that's what, if people would have got that revelation like John had, that he was loved by God, then it would have been a wonderful Elul, a, a wonderful month. And it goes back to the Song of Solomon's. And then you get to Rosh Hashanah, and, and the trumpets are blowing, and, and it's the, the new year, the head of the year. And then from Rosh Hashanah, you go 10 more days, and you get what? Yom Kippur, right? The day of judgment, right? But you're ready for the judgment. Why? Because you've already went through a lull, and God's mercy always precedes his judgment, and you have a sacrifice. And Jesus said, if that sacrifice was good enough to get you through a year, my sacrifice of me will get you through forever, eternity. And I think sometimes we act like a sacrifice wasn't good enough to where it even lasts us to the day. That's not true. That, that underestimates who Jesus is. Our danger is not to, to over-exaggerate the gospel, but to underestimate who Jesus really is. And when we get a, a, a revelation of that, so now they're coming in to literally, it's called, called um, Sukkot, uh, last eight days and so eight is always like new beginnings right sunday we celebrate church on sunday which would literally is after the seventh day so you could call it one but we also call it the eighth day why because it's opening up into new beginnings and new life and and but here he is he's going into the feast of tabernacle he's telling us they're halfway through and here jesus is literally the one who is coming to tabernacle in us. Remember the angels? When they showed up, they said, I have terrible news. Bad tidings. There is judgment and, and horror coming. That's not what he said. Dude, I got the Christmas story wrong. Right? What did he say? Glad tidings. Good news, man. What? To you, a Savior is born, right? And his name will be? Jesus. 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 It'll be Emmanuel. What is that? God, God with us. But that with, like I was talking about in, in, in John chapter 1, is not just like, hey, I'm going with you or I'm hanging with you. But it's literally in John chapter 1, that's prose. It's like face to face, so connected, so enamored with one another but that you can't tell the difference between them and you. That's pretty powerful. And he's like, hey, that's what I'm going to be with you. We're going to be tight, man. So tight that I'm going to be in you. And so they're at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they're celebrating. This is really what it's representing is Jesus tabernacling where? With us and in us. Christ in heaven, our hope of glory. Christ where? in us our hope of glory now is he in heaven yeah is, is he in the bible says if i make david said if i make my bed in hell you can't get anywhere away from god's presence he's everywhere if he's everywhere he's definitely in us but we can literally feel him and know that he's in us and that's where it said christ in us is a hope of glory that glory is 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 kabod it's a it's a, a weightiness it's a heaviness it's a but not in a bad way there's weight to it like you ever talk to someone and they got some weight to their words like, like i go around like i'm in the horse world and like we go compete at the 
challenges and we get these young young kids and they're all trying to win they're all trying to beat us and then i get around the good guys who really know they put the horse first and they we try to help each other and there's a weight to what they're saying because what they're saying is coming from their heart and it's coming with an intention that's not just about i don't care about buckles i don't care about money i don't care about this what's best for that horse and what's best for that horse is for you to do good and so that's the same kind of weightiness that God gives us when someone has some weight to their speech. And that's what he's saying, the hope of glory. There's a weight and a glory and an honor that we carry because we're sons and daughters of, of the Most High. I was pulling onto the, to the freeway and there was a, a highway patrolman or state patrol guy pulling on and everybody's at speed and go, <laughs> you know why? Because there's a weight, a weightiness that he carries. And that's what you have, too, in, in Jesus, right? And so Jesus is like, here, literally, there, so the Jewish people will make little huts and, and, and sukkahs, and then they'll live outside, literally, and they'll wave branches, and, and, um, <clears throat> and they have fruit, and, or these, these it's like lemon-like things, and fruit and all this stuff, and they just hang out, man. And they're looking at the stars, and I think they're looking at the same stars that Abraham was looking at when God said, said, so will your seed be, when God gave him his promise. But even more, what about the promise of him being in us? So here, they're going to celebrate Sukkot, and Jesus like, like answers them, and he says this, yeah, you guys are right, I better get on TV and show everybody how good I am. I'm going to go to Israel Idol. <laughs> and start singing. No, he didn't. He says this. Therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. I got these. I should use them, right? You know what? These work real good because like, I can see better here, but if people look funny out there, you just get blurry. So it's not near as scary. <laughs> Therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come for you any time is right. They're like, you don't, you don't know, you don't understand, you don't discern the times and the seasons, which is another word, there's another word in it where, where he was before and what, what was before uh, is now and what was now has been already. And, and they talk about it in Ecclesiastics and it's a word called kabar, which has a lot of meaning. But Jesus understood this and, and he was like, on a different plane to them, but they're saying, you know, for you just any time's right. He's like, but I have an appointed time and God has an appointed plan for my life. And guess what? He does for your life too. You're not here by coincidence. The Bible says before the foundations of this world were established, he saw you. That makes you pretty valuable. There's nothing you're ever gonna go through. There's nothing you're ever gonna face. There's nothing you're gonna do wrong or do right that he doesn't already know. He's that big. And guess what? He still chose from the foundations of the earth to give his life for us. He chose it way before they went to arrest him in the garden. He chose it way before he even sent his son, his only son. And he still chose you. The question is, will you choose you? Will you choose to let the past go? Will you choose to let those things go and choose that, you know what, I am in him. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus. all that stuff can pass away. The old will pass away. I'm a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, some things have become new. All things have become new. Give yourself a break. Trust him. Let him do something great in your life, right? So therefore, Jesus told them, no, I'm not going on Israel Idol. You're not going on Good Morning Israel. But he says, therefore, Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come for you. Any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Watch, he didn't say he wasn't going. He says, I am not yet going. Like, oh, Jesus lied. I, we caught him. No, that's not what he said. Now listen. 
Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, "Where is that man?" Among the crowds, there was a right widespread whispering about him. Some said he is a good man. Some still say he's a good man. He's a good teacher. Others replied, no, he deceives people. Some still say he deceived people. But no one would say anything public about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Uh, hello? He kind of wrote it. That's his book. I think he kind of knows what it's saying. Right? Here the Pharisees were focused on what they do and focused on, on, on having a knowledge of God but not having a experience and a relationship with him. And there's a difference. And that's what Jesus is like, hey, I'm trying to tell you, look, I am he. I am the one. And here you guys don't even get it. You don't even see me. You're rejecting me. And do you know what? There's so many times in my own life where I still reject him and still reject what he's done in my life because I have to get in this mindset where I have to do, 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 and I have to know, no, no. And he's like, no, I don't want you to have knowledge. I want you to have a knowing and an experience. Like, I can know who my wife is, but, like, she's going to hit me over the head if I don't really know her, you know? I know what she likes most of the time. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm talking about? It's about a relationship, and that's what Jesus is saying. I come, when he says, I come... Emmanuel, God with us, he's like, it's no longer do, do, do. It's about done, done, done. Rest in me. Walk in me. Walk with me. Let me flow out of you and love other people. And then, other, then it will explode out rather than trying to hit every box. Dot every T. I guess dot every I cross every D. Some people dot T's. Where am I at? What's that? Thank you. I'd be lost without you, bro. <laughs> Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does not, his own does so to gain honor for himself, but he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has Moses not given you the law? Yet no one, not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? It's like you're basing everything on the law and on your ability to keep the law. And he's saying it has nothing to do with, with your keeping. It has a believing in me. And when you believe in him and have a relationship with him, you want to do good for him, man. You want to love him. You want to, you want to, you want to help him. You want, you want to, that stuff just comes out and you become more like him. So he says, you are demon possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all astonished. Yet because Moses gave you circumcision, Though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? And then he says this, Stop judging by mere appearances and make right judgment. Everything that we look at and we think and we see, we think, well, that's right and that's God and that's good. See, we'd have looked at Jesus on the 
on the, um, <clears throat> on the mountain, you know, feeding the 5,000. We said, that's God. But when they all deserted, we said, well, there must be something wrong with him. The only thing wrong with him was he was telling the truth. We judge by what we see so much of the time in the physical, but that we forget that we are spiritual beings. And the Bible talks about us walking in the spirit. At, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? But we know where this man come from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know, you know me, and you know me, you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. This is the one that John's talking about that said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in him and through him were all things made. And they are just looking at him like he's a normal man. People still to this day, we still look, like, look at him like he's just a normal man. To this day, we still look at him like he just went to the cross and he died on the cross and then he disappeared to heaven after he resurrected and we'll see him again one day when he's like, I've come to live in and through you right now. Is he going to come again? Absolutely. But right now, we need a resurrection in the body of Christ to allow him to live in and through us. And that's when we'll start seeing the fruit of who he really is. Because then we're not trying to work for something that we, don't, that we already have. We're walking in him. Where am I at? Anybody know? I get to talking. I know him and say, and at this they tried to give him kisses and hugging. Because they're like, oh, he's just like a sweet little teddy bear from Texas that sings really loud and wipes his head bald. You know. no. No. And this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. And Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time. And then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where the people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did, the, what did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. They had Jesus right in front of them in physical form. And they missed him. We have Jesus right here now in physical form too. And he looks like Will and Crystal and Jim and Millie and John and maybe even Sam a little. <laughs> and we miss him. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from heaven. From where? From where? From within here. Now listen again. On the last and great day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. 
So what's happening is it's called the water libation service, it's called Hosanna, Hosanna Rabba. And so, so they'll pour the water out and they'll pour wine out, but they'll go down the steps. And as they're going down the steps, they'll sing these songs of ascension. And like they have all the Levites out, man. They have the whole band. They have the harps and the trumpets and the guitars and, you know, the synthesizers, everything you need, you know, the flutes. And as they're going down here, it's like a great spectacle. Like, like in, in um, the, the rabbis always talk about how if you haven't seen a celebration and a feast and a joy until you've seen Hoshana Rabbah. And because it was about living water. It was about that water flowing in and through. And so here was such a great rejoicing and such a great spectacle. And they're coming in and out and up. And this is where Jesus is. And Jesus stands up. And he says, on the last day of the greatest feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, if anyone, you know what anyone means? Anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Remember when Jesus was hungry and he was at a well and he just wanted to drink of water. And he ends up giving this this lady life, right? He's like, are you thirsty? He says, I have water you know nothing about. Because he is the living water. He is the bread of life. He is everything you're ever going to want or need. And in him you'll find everything you want and need. He says, by this he meant the spirit whom whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not given since had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Now, what's he saying? The Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, they talk about how the Holy Spirit would come upon a prophet. Now, on, on Shavuot, on Pentecost, guess where the Holy Spirit come? Whew. Inside. Now, I still cannot believe that we don't have the very breath of God and that God still wasn't living with his breath in people, but there was a difference. You guys understand what I'm saying? We're all made in his God, God's image. We all have his DNA. And I have seven minutes to do two hours worth of preaching, so I'm going to hurry. <laughs> might have two minutes because we might have a song. <laughs> so here Jesus says, by this he meant the Spirit, because he hadn't been glorified. Jesus went away, and then Peter stood up and said, said, they're not drunk, as you suppose, right? The Holy Spirit fell. But he's talking about the Holy Spirit living in and through them after he is glorified, which means a whole lot more that I'm out of time. I'm going to have to do another one. <laughs> On hearing his word, some of the people said, surely this man is a prophet. Others said, he is a Christ. Right answer. Still others ask, how can the Christ come from Galilee? How can, how can a preacher come from Oklahoma or Texas? Or Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, which he did? I want to take you back to Isaiah. And I want to read to you where Jesus was talking about. Because he just didn't read the word. He was the word and is the word and always will be the word. But it says in Isaiah 12, Verse 1, in that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry, angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. Who is my salvation? My works, my good deeds? No, God is my salvation. That is G-O-D, so it's Elohim. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, yud heh vav heh, Yahweh, the Lord, it says it twice, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Now, when you read this in Hebrew, it's literally, when you say my salvation, he's literally saying, He's talking about himself, the Lord, the, the Lord. You know what Yeshua means? That's Jesus' name in Hebrew. It means Yahweh, salvation. So literally what he's saying, and, and he, in my song, he has become my Yeshua. 
It's literally what it's saying right here in the scriptures. You know, see Jesus' name littered all through here. I don't mean littered as in littered, but I mean it's, that's a poor choice of words for Jesus. But all through here. And then it says, with sorrow and anger and madness. No. With hopelessness. With good works. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. When he's at that woman at the well, do you know? Like, I have water. You're looking for all these things on the outside to satisfy you. But until you drink from me, nothing's going to satisfy you. Because I'm your peace. I will fill that thirst and you will never thirst again. Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.